um, and um, is refreshed and ready to go. So we had had a question um, previously about what is a historic property. So that's exactly um, what we're going to start discussing now. How do we determine if we have a historic property? So um, just to kind of recap on where we are in the process, um, we've already determined that um, there is a federal undertaking. So we initiated the Section 106 process and we identified the APE for the project. So now that we have our APE, we have to find out our if there's any historic properties within it that might be affected. So how do we know if we have a historic property? Well, then we look at the regulations, which are cited here in the, um, on the slide. Um, so the term historic property is a historic district site building structure or object in or eligible for inclusion on the National Register. And that's what kind of gets people a little bit um, confused whenever we're looking at things for Section 106, because um, those properties that are eligible for listing in the National Rest Register are treated the same as those that are listed in the National Register. And the reason for this is because it takes a lot of work um, to list something in the National Register, and it also can be very expensive. It's about um, the amount of work that you would see in a master's level thesis to develop um, a National Register nomination. So we can't have that, you know, that if we required everybody to register their properties, um, you know, as part of, you know, our Section 106 undertaking, it would just be, um, you know, a massive thing. And so this kind of removes that burden um, of actually listing, um, but, but requires that we take into account effects on eligible properties as well. Um, what is the National Register of Historic Places? Uh, the National Register of Historic Places is our nation's honor roll. It's an honorary listing. Um, being listed on the National Register, oftentimes people think that saves or protects their buildings um, or structures or historic sites or um, archaeological sites, but it actually doesn't provide any um, extra um, protection. So what it does do is it says this place is important and it records its history and, um, you know, gets notif you know, you get notified and people are aware that the property is listed and that comes with a certain um, level of, I guess, cachet for some people. But um, that does not change how we view projects for Section 106. Um, if a property is eligible, like I said, it's treated as the same as listed. And so for the purposes of 106, eligible and listing get the same amount of protection as it were. Now, as Amy said previously, um, the federal agency is driving the bus. So if um, their project is going to have an adverse effect, and we'll talk about effects later, um, basically if it's gonna damage a historic property, um, we don't get to say no. A lot of times people think if you've got a property, it's listed on the National Register, that means you can't change it. You can't do anything to it. That is just not the case. Um, you can do, you know, the federal agency can do whatever project um, they would like to do, but they are required to take into account the effects of their project on um, the federal, um, I mean, on the property. So that is what the Section 106 process does, is it takes into account um, the effects. So let's talk about what types of resources are eligible for listing on the National Register. Um, the first and primary one um, that we see, um, you know, most commonly are buildings. And how do we differentiate buildings from other types of resources? Buildings are specifically built to shelter human activity. So when we use the term building, we are talking about, you know, a house, a barn, something that was used for humans to conduct business or live in or protect or shelter. So houses, churches, hotels, these types of things are buildings. So then we also have structures and structures were created for a purpose other than creating human shelters. So like here we have a bridge it's used for, you know, crossing from one side of something to the other side. We have, um, you know, a, 
a grain storage bin and we have a corn crib. These are not for sheltering human activity. They are for other purposes. I mean, while they are related to human activity, they're not solely for sheltering humans. Um, the next type of property um, is a, a site. And this is where, you know, a lot of our archeological sites come in here, but you can also have it as a site of something that, you know, that happened like a battlefield, those types of things. Um, so these aren't always things that you can see, um, but sometimes they are, um, but they, um, they possess significance, um, you know, as a location, as in addition to what you can see. Then we have objects. Objects are pretty, um, they can be different sizes as we have here. We have two different examples. Sometimes they're small in scale and um, sometimes they're large like the fountain you see here that's out in front of the Capitol. Um, so they can be artistic in nature, but they have significance in the location in which they are. So if you pick that up and you move it somewhere else, it doesn't have that same context that it had when it was in that location. And these oftentimes get overlooked um, whenever uh, we are talking about historic districts because um, they are sometimes, like I said, small in scale. So it might be something like a um, light pole that is, you know, dates to the period of significance to a historic district where in itself, it doesn't necessarily um, you know, is it necessarily eligible for listing on the National Register, but it is, um, you know, as part of that historic district, it sets the setting in the place. And we'll talk a little bit about the importance of the setting um, and the place in a minute. So, um, you know, these, a lot of, like, when you're in um, a historic farmstead, they might also, you know, include items like fences or tanks, you know, different types of things like that. So they may not necessarily be beautiful, but they are contributing to the historic district. Um, the next type are um, historic district. And we see these a lot in historic downtowns, historic uh, districts of historic homes. Um, you know, they have a connection or a linkage between them. So in these situations, um, sorry, in these situations, um, they have a common history that is, um, you know, conveyed through that place. So it might be that the district is eligible as um, a commercial center. It might be eligible as like we have here, a historic farm um, or, you know, a group of um, historic homes that are significant for um, architecture. It could also be a group um, of historic buildings that are significant for ethnic history. Um, you know, so some buildings are really easy to look at and say, yes, that is eligible for the National Register because it's, you know, it's high style. And some of them are a little bit harder um, to identify. So we will discuss that in a minute. Um, the next type are landscapes. And these are ones that I think um, we have a lot of hard time um, identifying not just um, in Missouri, but we, we do have a lot, we do see these missed a lot um, in our reports and in our projects. So um, rural landscapes are, they were developed as a response to humans need um, to live in the environment. So um, what we have a lot of here in Missouri on these rural landscapes that might be eligible for listing in the National Register um, are um, farmsteads and what we have up in the upper left, which are um, mining districts. So we have a lot of these, um, you know, kind of areas that were changed um, for mining. And so when we're looking at eligibility, we're not just identifying the type of resource, um, but we are identifying how it might be eligible. So we're going to come back and talk about um, how properties are eligible for listing on the National Register in just a couple slides. Um, but right now we're just going over the property types um, and we'll talk more about um, what makes a landscape significant in just a minute. So in addition to 
the rural landscapes that kind of pop up as um, you know a response to um, human needs um, in an area to respond to that. We have design landscapes, and these are a lot easier to define because there are you know oftentimes designed by landscape architects or master gardeners and and things like that to make a setting or um, somewhere that has a special sense of place. Um, so, you know, these are a little bit more rare um, to find than the kind of just the rural landscapes. So now that we know the different types of resources, we're going to talk a little bit about how we evaluate um, properties for listing on the National Register. So, you know, everybody's heard the if it's over 50 years old um, thing and they've heard you know, if it's if it's old, then it, it needs to be checked for historic. So um, what we do um, for primarily for Section 106, which is a little bit uh, different than uh, for uh, our regular National Register evaluation is we're evaluating properties generally that are 45 years and older. And the reason why for Section 106, we're looking for projects, properties that are over 45 years um, is because um, a lot of projects take several years to actually come to fruition. So um, it might be sitting on the shelf for a while. So if we don't have that time space built in, then by the time the project actually happens, it may end up that there was something that didn't get reviewed um, because of that. Also, um, because of that kind of guidelines, that's um, we also say that our letters um, with our determinations are good for five years because we have looked at those five years. So if you have a letter from our office um, and your scope of work has not changed um, and the project is five years old, um, you know, you might need to resubmit. If it's under five years old since you've consulted with our office, um, then, then you should be good. So that's kind of why we look at 45. So what else are we looking at? We have an old property. How do we know if we care? You know, because there's so many old buildings out there. Um, that National Park Service has set up these criteria for evaluating historic properties. Um, the first one is, so they're, they're really cleverly named, criteria A, B, C, and D. Um, criteria A are those associated with events. Um, so these are the ones that sometimes aren't super easy to see. Um, these might be your properties that are eligible for something um, under social history. They might be eligible um, for an event that happened there. They might be eligible, um, you know, for politics or government, recreation. There's a whole list of items that we're looking at. So if you get a letter from our office and we're trying to figure out if um, a property is eligible, we might be looking at it and saying it's over 45 years old. It has integrity. We just need to know if something happened here with this. So you might get a letter from our office saying, you know, we need to know a little bit about the history and we'll list some items about the history that um, we have questions about. And what we're trying to do is establish if the property is eligible under Criterion A. Now, if um, just to kind of back step a little bit, um, if you are acting on behalf of a federal agency, but you are not the federal agency. That is primarily um, what we are, are discussing whenever I'm saying, um, you know, that hasn't been identified. If the federal agency is contacting our office, they should have already identified this information. Um, if um, you're acting on behalf of a federal agency, that's because the responsibilities have been delegated down to you. Um, and most of those projects are HUD projects or Department of Energy. Um, projects, those get delegated down to a grant applicant or to the local level. And so that's kind of why we want to explain this information here is so that you can understand what we're looking for and hopefully provide us with a little bit better information um, than, than you might have previously. And so we can cut down on kind of returning some of those um, items for additional um, additional information. So. Um, the next criteria that we're going to talk about are uh, is criterion B, and that is for big people or people who had big impacts on history, and that can be on the local, state, or federal level. Um, 
generally these properties are those that are associated with the productive part of that person's life. So um, primarily, you know, like places of business, offices are more likely to be eligible under criterion B, but it, it can be a person's home or, um, you know, other associated space, depending on the history and the nature um, of the property. So we're always willing to talk about that. That's probably the one that um, is hardest for us at SHPO to identify because we really have to have information. There's not like, excuse me, like a visual cue there um, like um, you would have with um, one that's eligible under Criterion C. And um, Criterion C are properties that embody the distinctive characteristics are a type or period or method of construction. So what that means is this is a building. When you look at it, you say somebody designed that or that has architectural style. I may not know what the style is, but I know that it has it. So these are the easiest ones for us to find um, from a photograph. So that's why we're wanting really good photographs um, of the properties to one, be able to tell if they might be eligible because of um, you know, architecture, but also to see uh, what their integrity level is. So we're going to talk about integrity um, here in a minute. Um, so the last, oh, so I forgot to mention under criterion C also, in addition to those that are high style, you might also have properties that are eligible for their artistic merit or for their engineering. And we see engineering significance a lot with bridges and dams and you know different engineered facilities uh, there um, and then criterion d um, are um, those likely to yield data while this mostly applies to archaeological sites um, it can also apply to buildings um, so these are ones where um, you might have done a field survey um, had a field survey conducted for archaeology you found something we are not excavating the whole thing as part of this. We know that um, from the, um, the the artifacts that were found that there's likely a site there that could be uh, yield that information. Then that is what we're looking at um, under Criterion D for archaeology. And then for architecture, sometimes um, something might be built out of or used a style of construction that is unique um, and those would be um, eligible under Criterion D. So going back to discussing some of the information that we were talking about about rural landscapes, when we're looking at those, we are looking at Criteria A. Um, and so we're looking to see if that mining history, um, you know, created something in that area that, um, you know, did it, did it, um, make a major life way there that that the rest of the people who lived in that area would have never lived there, but for that construction of that mine and that there. How long was it in operation? Does this mine show, um, you know, does it, it look like it did during the period of significance? And that period of significance is the area, is the period when it was active or when, um, you know, a property is um, eligible for listing in the National Register when that thing happened. So that's what we're looking at um, with those mines. And we get a lot of projects um, to kind of improve the road um, by some of these mining areas. And so that's what we're looking at. We're trying to determine how much of that mining area might be impacted, how much of it might have been impacted in the past. And, um, you know, what does this project, you know, is this area eligible? And does this project affect the eligibility for listing in the National Register? With those rural landscapes like farms, um, we see a lot of impacts from roads, but the ones that get overlooked the most are um, utility lines um, going through farms. So a lot of times when we're talking about a farm, um, you know, a project may um, have a visual APE of so many feet on either side. And so if you're going through the historic uh, fields historically associated with a farm, it may not actually be that any buildings are in that APE because the farm may be so large. So um, it might be possible to overlook um, a historic farm in that area. So oftentimes when people are researching 
um, these properties, they'll look at the property history to see if the parcels still kind of reflect what they looked like in the past. Um, and so try and determine if there's any integrity in the fields, and then they might look further um, a field haha, um, for historic properties. Um, now, a farm field on its own is not going to be eligible for listing on the National Register unless um, something really significant happened there. However, um, it would not be uncommon for a historic farm field to be um, eligible if the historic house barns and other um, ancillary buildings were in place. So sometimes whenever you're doing like a corridor project um, involving um, a um, utility line, then you need to establish those boundaries of those historic farm parcels and then look further outside of what might have been the typical visual APE to try and determine if you're in a historic district or not. And, um, you know, these properties, are, um, I, I would say, intact historic farmsteads are a endangered resource um, in Missouri. So we want to be mindful of that when we're designing these pro these projects. Um, while, you know, it may not be um, that the project is super visible from the historic property. So, you know, from the, the main part of the historic property, if the you know, you're putting in a corridor, utility corridor through there, you might um, actually bisect the field and then make a visual separation um, that then kind of impacts the integrity of the historic district. So that's what we're looking at um, for those items. Um, so in addition to the criteria, we have the four criteria. We've looked to see if we have any properties um, I see we have a question about farms. Um, farms do not have to be registered as a century farm. That is separate from um, national register eligibility. Um, so a, a property can be a century farm and not be eligible for listing in the national register. However, if you're doing research, looking at those century farms is highly recommended in order to try and identify areas that you should um, investigate further just to see if there is an, you know, if there is an intact farmstead there or not. So that's a great cue to help you with your research, but not necessarily the end all be all on that. So um, we have con criteria considerations for listing things on the National Register. So just because something's over 50 years old and just because it minimally meets one of those criteria that were on the previous page does not necessarily mean that that property is going to be listed on the National Register and eligible for listing on the National Register. So we have these um, fun things that we can look at called criteria considerations. Um, so cemeteries and birthplaces and are kind of similar in that they can be eligible as part of a historic district. They can be eligible individually. However, just because a historic person, a person of, of historical significance is buried in a cemetery or was born in a building does not necessarily mean that it's going to be eligible under criterion B um, for the National Register. And the reason for that being is what I was saying earlier about being associated um, with the um, with the productive life of the individual. So if there are historic buildings where that person performed whatever it was that they were significant for. So say maybe they established um, a business that was really vital to the area and employed a lot of people, then that business would be the first thing that we would think of and, pro and the most significant. So if we have that and their house going to their birthplace where they maybe only lived for a couple of years um, or the cemetery where they're buried, you know, those you know, it's it's just not as significant. Now, some things, that's all we've got, you know, especially um, with some of our, um, you know, our, our early settlers or our, um, our um, sorry, our people significant in social history may only be their grave site is the only thing that's left. And so it is significant for that. So we have to consider those items and what else is available and recording recording that person's life before 
we can say 100% if something is eligible um, for that area of significance. Um, just because something is a church does not mean that it's eligible for listing on the National Register. Um, what uh, for to be sorry for to be listed under the National Register as a church, it has to have had some other area of significance other than just religion. Um, so um, what those are primarily are architecture and events. So there might be um, a church that's significant to social history, and then it could be listed under criterion A. Or you might have a church that was eligible because of its distinctive architectural style, and it could be eligible under criterion C. But just because something is a church or was owned by a religious institution does not make it eligible for listing on the National Register. Um, so the next thing that we have to look at is if a, a structure has been moved. Structures that have been moved um, and they don't have retain their um, location and setting integrity. So we'll talk about that in just a minute uh, is integrity. Um, we, um, you know, they, they've changed their integrity and so they're not eligible for listing on the National Register. That isn't 100% the case. There are, you know, situations where something is extremely important or has a high uh, level of integrity that might be an exception to that. But we have to look at that. There is also an option for once something is listed on the National Register, if it's endangered um, or needs to be moved for a reason, there is a process for moving properties. So um, if we have a project involving federal funding and um, the project has to move something, then we have a process set forward in uh, the guidelines for the National Register on how we should do that. So as long as we follow that process, um, there'll be no adverse effect um, on the property. But that's for those that are listed. So if your property is just eligible, um, that does not apply. So we would be going through the adverse effect uh, process if it's not already listed. Um, those buildings that have been reconstructed, and we'll talk more about reconstruction, but a reconstructed building is one that they, like maybe had some pictures, the building had been lost, they maybe had some pictures or some plans and they reconstructed the building um, in that location, in the same location. Um, that does not mean that it's going to be eligible for listing on the National Register. However, there are cases um, where a property was well documented in a historic district and was lost due to national, natural disaster. And then those plans that we had had previously um, and documentation were used to reconstruct that building exactly the way that it was. And it still, re it, it contributes to the historic district in that case. So we have to look at that, you know, what, what, what is it and what were the cases? Um, uh, so, those properties that are primarily commemorative in nature are often not eligible for listing on the National Register individually. They may be eligible for listing um, as part of a historic district, or they may be eligible um, depending upon how long they've been there, if they have artistic merit, things like that. They can be eligible, but they're not necessarily eligible just because of what they are. And the last one, um, criteria consideration that we have to look at are properties that are less than 50 years old, less than 50, less than 45. Sometimes a property is just so significant that it's eligible for listing on the National Register from the moment that an event happens or um, from the moment, you know, that it's constructed or uh, not long afterwards. So here we have a picture of the arch. Um, the arch um, was constructed in 1963 to 65 and was listed as a National Historic Landmark in 1987. So it had not yet re reached 50 years old when it was listed, but nobody is going to be like, yeah, that's not significant. It's not architecturally significant. It's not a landmark. There's, you know, it, it just is. So um, there are exceptions. And so when we review your projects, we're thinking about all of these things in addition to uh, property's integrity. There are seven aspects of integrity um, that we look at. Some of them are really easy for us 
to identify. And this is why those photographs are so important um, when you're submitting your, your project. Um, we are looking, um, we don't often know if a property has been moved from a photograph. That would be something that you would have to tell us. But um, we're looking to see if the location um, is, seems appropriate or about the right time period. Is, if it was in a historic district, is it still there? We see a lot in our larger cities where um, the setting and the location and association integrity um, may be affected. Like that, a building may be really great, high style, but when it was constructed, it was in a densely populated neighborhood. And now, you know, everything around it's been demolished. So it's integrity of location, setting, feeling, and association have been, um, you know, degraded. So we have to look at that and see if that property is still eligible for listing um, on the National Register. The ones that are easier for us to see are design, materials, and workmanship. It's easy for us to look at a building and say, it hasn't been changed that much. It looks like it has its original footprint or that looks like it's had a lot of additions. We can look at it and say, those materials look appropriate for the age of that structure or they do not. And so a lot of times I'm looking at your photographs and I'm saying, is that vinyl siding? And I'm trying to, so I'm trying to look at a photograph that may or may not be of a sufficient size and trying to determine if something has vinyl siding or clabbered siding. So that's um, why you might get um, a project uh, request for additional photographs, because I can't tell. You know, if I'm looking at a building and it looks like it's got clabbered siding, um, so wood siding, and that's probably what was there originally, then it has a higher level of integrity than a property that was replaced with vinyl siding. Now, there are a few tricks and things that, um, that I use to try and figure out things about like if it's vinyl siding or not. A lot of times there'll be a trim around the windows that I can find, but sometimes the picture is just too small or too pixelated or too, um, you know, too grainy for me to be able to see it. So we're going to talk more about what makes a good photograph later, um, but um, we will talk more about that. And yes, it would be helpful to describe materials in your submission. So if you're looking at a project, at submitting a project, and something has vinyl siding and replacement windows, just say it in the in this the project description section. Then I'll read that and be like, oh, gotcha. Okay, I know that now. So that way I'm not wasting time trying to guess. And then if I don't know, sending it back to you and being like, I need I need better pictures. So having a little bit of description in there about your building, just kind of what may have changed in the building over time is really helpful. Um, so I can't always tell if something has replacement windows because sometimes, um, you know, with um, storm windows, it can be really difficult uh, to know if that's changed. Um, if something, you know, maybe the porch has changed on a building, you should point that out. If it's got lots of additions, you should point that out. These are all the things that are going to help me to be able to assess the integrity of your property. So. You may have gotten a letter from us um, that said, we're not able to determine we need better photographs or we need um, this information about additions. That is what I'm trying to get at um, for this. I'm trying to assess if the property has integrity. I'm looking at it. I've got the pictures. I'm looking at it. I'm like, I don't know if it's eligible or not. Um, so I need more information. So um, this is why I do that. So. Anytime we're reviewing your project, we're looking at all of these aspects um, when we're determining eligibility. Um, if a project's um, scope of work is not going to have an adverse effect um, on the property, you may have received a letter from us that says um, we're unable to determine if this property is eligible for listing on the National Register. However, the scope of work as proposed will have no adverse effects. Um, that's what I've written in case, instead of sending you information to make a determination completely. So I don't, I don't think based on the scope of work that we have to necessarily say 100% for this one. Um, we're not having an adverse effect, so we're just, you know, that's, that's what we're going to work on. So um, 
it says, um, I have a question here that says, what happens when SHPO and the lead federal agency disagree as to whether or not something is eligible? This is a great question. I'll touch on it now, and we'll also talk on it some more later. Um, when we have a disagreement, um, we can discuss it. Um, we go back and forth. We'll say, this is why I see this, or this is why I see that. Primarily, a lot of it is us just not, not having enough information to know. You know, like we've been looking at this information. We might have asked you for more information. And we're like, I, I still don't know then we haven't said that it's not eligible for listing on the National Register. So a lot of that depends on the information that we get, you know, and sometimes we have to look at it and say, you know, what is the level of information that we would need to establish if this is eligible? Sometimes the information that we need is so great that it would be the same level of something that would be um, in the realm of mitigation. And in that case, you know, we would, um, you know, suggest that we just go ahead and do mitigation instead of trying to waste your time doing this on something. So we'll, we'll discuss that about you and give, and give you a call. But if the federal agency and SHPO ultimately disagree, we've been provided enough information to say, yep, we really think that's eligible. And the federal agency says, no, then the keeper of the National Register of Historic Places is consulted. And that is a position at the National Park Service. They oversee um, the National Register. So we would um, submit information, both our office and the federal agency would submit information as to why we thought something was eligible to the keeper and the keeper would make an official determination and the keeper's determination is final. So I hope that helps answer your question on that. Um, I have a question here about a list or agencies to check with listing of significant rural landscapes aside from NHR, uh, so the National Register of Historic Places um, or certified local governments. Those are really the places to check. Um, we do not have a great list. Um, like I said, um, you know, looking at that Century Farm list is helpful. Um, we have a few items in our barns and farmstead surveys. Um, I don't know, Patrick, about um, your credentials off the off the top of my head, but um, if you have access to our architect, our archaeological viewer, then you would have a little bit more information, cultural resources reports, and things like that had happened um, in an area previously. Those would be the things that we would direct you to uh, to look at and see if something had been identified. Um, in addition, you know, sometimes you just have to hire a qualified professional to investigate. So if you have one property, I would say, you know, we can probably discuss that, work on that between our office um, and the agency. However, um, if you're doing like a large corridor study, you're going to need to probably get a professional who does have access to those items and who can um, perform research on the history of the parcels, not necessarily the uh, title history is not really what I'm talking about, but um, the mapping history and viewing some of the maps that are available um, at the Missouri Historical Society and doing some of that digging and researching um, to help identify um, if there might be, you know, if that area might have potentially um, the same shape it did historically. So what we're looking at is um, a lot of times when we're looking at a uh, rural landscape is what was the property that was associated it, with it in the past? And is that property still associated with it today? If it may not be associated, if you're looking at it in the aerial, is it maybe still visible? Sometimes those um, property lines are still super visible and sometimes they're not. Um, so being able to compare those historic maps um, is really important. Um, and we had a question earlier from Jennifer about something being registered as a farmstead. I'm, I'm not 100% about um, what your question was exactly. A farmstead can be listed in the National Register um, for, depending upon like if it were an industrial, um, you know, more industrial operation, it could be listed under industry and it can be listed under agriculture um, under criterion A. Um, you sometimes also see them, um, you know, it might have additional areas of significance. So 
Um, just because something's eligible under one area does not mean that it's not eligible under other areas. So it might be eligible under B, C, or D um, as well. But you need to find something if, like, for something to be eligible it has to be eligible under one criteria. Um, but um, it doesn't have to be listed under all criteria um, that it's eligible for. So now we have a fun little quiz to wake everybody up after all my talking. Um, so I guess I better give control back to Jeffrey. Um, so for this slide, we have two questions. Um, the first one is, does this building have integrity? It has its original siding, windows, doors, and has not been moved. It does have an addition at the rear constructed in the 1930s, but it uses similar siding to the house. And the second question is, is this property eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places? And you can select, I don't know, you can select yes, you can select no, or you need more information to decide. But any of those are appropriate. So I'll give you guys a minute. Um, so we had a question here from Aaron that while you guys are, are doing that poll um, that said, um, how much does the degree of public interest in a facility factor into determining if it's historic? It doesn't determine at all. Um, so the public could be interested or have no interest. Um, I'm sure some of you on this call have been in a discussion regarding an MOA with me um, where no public parties have shown up or really submitted much comment. Um, and I'm sure that some of you have been in calls with me or meetings with me where they have been very interested. That public interest um, factor comes in when um, we're evaluating what type of um, mitigation is appropriate. And it also should come in, the reason why that the, we're supposed to involve the public early in the process at the very beginning is to find out whenever you're scoping your project what that level of interest is in those properties and try and make a um, scope of work that is appropriate for um, that, um, that resource. So one would hope that um, the federal agency would get feedback on a resource that was highly significant to people and maybe um, you know, avoid that resource as part of their project. Um, but it may also, um, you know, they may also take that public comment into consideration and still do their project anyway. And so that's one of the pluses and minuses about having, um, you know, the federal, the federal agency uh, being the one driving the bus. So it looks like everybody or a lot of people had had um, time to vote and um, for if this building has integrity, um, a lot of people said yes, and that is the correct answer. Yes, it retains integrity. Um, good job. Um, so um, is this property eligible for listing on the National Register? Most people said, I need more information, and that's a perfectly good answer. Um, you know, we will, um, you know, that's why we ask for additional information. I know it's frustrating, um, but on the one hand, you know, especially if you are acting in place of the federal agency, sometimes it could be burdensome to find a lot of information about every property that you're working on over 50 years old. Most of your properties probably are over 45 years old that you're working on if they're in, in a lot of your programs. So, I mean, you can't find out everything about every property. I mean, it would just be so time cost, you know, and cost prohibitive. So it is perfectly appropriate to ask, you know, send it in. And that's why we ask for that additional information. So, um, you know, it's kind of a balancing act on your end as to how much time you have to put into things um, versus how much time, you know, the review might take if we send back and ask for more information. Um, for this one, though, if you had submitted a project on this one, I would probably look at it and say it's likely that it's eligible under Criterion C 
for architecture, and then I would evaluate your scope of work. Um, so, because, you know, there's more I know about this than you guys do. This is a rural area. Um, this is probably the best example of Queen Anne style vernacular architecture in the area. So, um, I would have walked Google Earth and looked at that area, looked at the setting photos you provided, and used that information to um, determine that. Then I would evaluate your scope of work. If it looks like it's going to have no adverse effect, um, then we would move forward. Um, Jeffrey, do you want to advance to the next slide and put up the next poll? So, um, this poll, it has two questions again. Uh, the first one is, does this building have integrity? The building has replacement siding and windows. And the second question is, is this property eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places? The building is part of a complex of buildings uh, built in support of World War II missions and has intact stonework built during the war that uh, connects the, to the buildings. I wrote connects connecting there. Sorry about that. That connects the buildings. So there's other buildings in this in this district. So we have a question from Mark um, regarding if we will be discussing historic districts, um, that NPS is also the gatekeeper and who sets up the districts. Um, I can discuss a little bit about that while um, we go over the poll because um, we hadn't um, planned to speak too much more about historic districts. Um, so um, the historic districts um, have a period of significance and an area of significance. So whenever we're looking at trying to determine if something is eligible for listing um, as a historic district, um, we will be trying to identify those items. Now, um, just like um, the, the, the eligibility and the National Register uh, that we discussed earlier about when we have a conflict between um, the federal agency and the SHPO, um, we have um, the National Park Service administers um, the National Register of Historic Places and the National Historic Landmark Program. Um, people make um, nominations to those, um, those either program um, at the federal agency, I'm sorry, at the, at the National Park Service, they make uh, the nominations to that area. They define the period of significance, the area of significance. And um, then um, the National Register, our, our National Register staff works with the Federal National Register staff and the preparer of the nomination to get those listed um, in the National Register. When we are looking to see if a property might be eligible as part of a district, um, we're doing a more abbreviated process because we don't have all that information. Um, so we might be asking you for additional information or um, also um, just trying to do the best we can with what we have um, you know, available to us resources. It's great to do this job in the time of Google Walk. Um, that helps a lot um, as far as establishing historic districts and evaluating integrity. However, um, as we'll discuss later, that those photos are not always up to date. Um, so it could be very difficult or, or very easy, but, um, you know, we are always working in collaboration with the applicant and the federal agency. And a lot of times too, you know, we're working with our internal National Register staff who do this identification on a regular basis. Um, so if we have a question about a property um, based on the information we have, and we're just really on the borderline, we'll also consult with those folks um, over in that section um, to make sure that we are making the best decision or requesting uh, the best level of information. So it looks like the poll results are in. Um, does this building have integrity? Um, is pretty well split between yes, no, and I'm not sure. And that's really great. I think that those are all um, good answers in this situation. This is not the best photograph. 
Um, so, um, but the building does have changes to its integrity. Like we said, it has replacement siding and windows. It obviously doesn't look quite like it probably did um, during World War II. Um, so it has taken on a little bit different um, appearance. So then that's when we start to look at the area of significance for a property. Um, so yeah, it's had some changes, but we look at this information that I provided um, in the second question about it being, um, you know, related to World War II. And you guys did a great job evaluating between, yes, it's eligible and I need more information. So I think both of those are great. I think taking this information that you have here, you know, these couple sentences, being able to say no at this point is a little bit, um, is, is a little bit early. I would probably request more information in this situation. I would um, work with my coworkers over in the National Register sec section, and we would discuss it if I had any questions. Um, so I will tell you that this property um, is eligible for listing on the National Register um, and, um, and was a project. I think there's one more. Okay, so does it retain integrity? Um, it, it does retain its integrity of location and setting. It does not retain its integrity of materials. So when we weigh a property to see if it is eligible for listing in the National Register, we're weighing the significance of that history and it against its level of integrity. So, so a lot of times it's kind of an even balance and, and that's what we have here. We have impacts to integrity. However, the significance is pretty high. We don't have a lot of resources um, you know, of this type in Missouri. It's also, you know, we're evaluating it against other similar resources built um, for uh, World War II buildup um, in the nation. So we would have to look at those items as well. I would say that its integrity is impacted, but it may not be impacted enough for it to not be a National Register eligible. However, if we take away that history um, and say that this was a home and say it was built in the same time period um, or maybe just after the war because a lot of houses weren't, this large weren't built during the war. But anyway, um, at, at this point, I would be looking at it individually. I'd be like, no, that's not eligible as a house. It's had too many changes. Um, if it were part of a historic district, then I would have to evaluate it against the other resources in the historic district. So knowing that history um, can really change your perspective on whether or not something is eligible or not. Um, So we've got a new poll up here. Um, it says, does this district have integrity? Um, the complex is composed of multiple buildings, all built in 1950. The site has its original layout, support buildings and structure, structures and roadways. The windows and doors of all the buildings have been replaced. And the second part is, is this eligible district eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places? Um, this is a public housing development constructed with federal assistance for low income families and the facility was originally segregated. So, Amy, are there any questions that I have missed? Um, there was one. Um from a little while back that asked, um, now I have to find it again. Um, H. Howard asked, would it be helpful to describe materials in photo captions? Yes, that would be very helpful. If you don't want to put it in the photos, you can also put it in the description section. So where you're talking about your scope of work, um, or you can attach something else that has it on there. Um, I do not have a problem um, if you are trying to like, say, identify which windows have been replaced, if you're on the pictures and you circle them and then you write a note that says all circled windows have been replaced, that's fine. 
you know, um, as long as it's circled in a way that number one, I can see the circles and number two, I can still see the building um, behind it. Um, that's okay too. Um, if you wanna identify certain parts of the building um, by writing on the photograph, um, drawing an arrow over to a section and saying something about that, um, that's fine. You know, I think I, I'm not too particular about how um, that information is conveyed, as long as it's conveyed in a way that I can understand um, what you're trying to say. Um, so I, I, I don't want to say you have to do it one way or another. Um, right. And so I sort of answered this in the comments, but I thought it would be good for you to actually answer it in the in the recording. Um, Angela Worker asks, is it helpful to make recommendations of eligibility and under what criteria when submitting information, or would you prefer to make those decisions at the SHPO? That is the federal agency's responsibility, actually. It is the federal agency, and if you're acting in place of the federal agency, it is technically your responsibility to do that. Um, so if you um, don't know, we'll help you out. Um, if you have um, an opinion, I would love to hear it and why, because you've probably seen more of that building than I'm gonna see in the photographs. Because remember, I'm, I'm relying on what you've sent me and what I can see on Google um, to try and determine um, eligibility on properties. So um, I definitely appreciate um, your input. Um, now it is SHPO's role to concur with that um, determination and findings. And so, um, you know, I might ask you for additional information or if I have a good amount of information there and I have a little question, I'll send you an email or give you a phone call. So if it's something simple, um, I will pick up the phone and ask you or send you an email and ask you most of the time. So, but if it's something like, oh my gosh, I need all of these things, then I'm going to send you a letter for sure. Um, uh, it looks like we have the poll results up about um, this particular picture. Um, so does the district have integrity? Um, most people said yes. And I would agree in a situation like this, um, a treatment's been applied across the district to every building. Um, so um, having um, those changes aren't as much of a big deal. Um, also, um, you know, that still conveys that sense of place when you visit the site, you know what it is, you know, you know, it's public housing. It still reads as that. Um, so, yes, it retains integrity. Um, and is the district eligible for listing um, on the National Register? Um, the majority said yes, and that I would concur with that. Yes, it is eligible. Um, we have a lot of public housing all over the US dating from different ranges. Um, you know, from kind of pre-World War II, kind of kind of interwar years, all the way up through current. And in the past, it has not been well documented. And um, there's been a lot of feeling from um, the public that um, that these histories have been overlooked and um, underappreciated. Um, so, you know, I try to take extra care when I'm evaluating um, a historic district um, that's that was um, associated with low income families or, or moderate income families, because while they may have undergone some changes, we don't want to lose the history of those people who um, lived in this area, what they went through, what the you know what their lives were like. We don't want to just record um, the lives of affluent people, we want to record the history of all people in Missouri and how that is expressed through the built environment. Um, HUD keeps saying that we're going to have um, a kind of a nationwide context to help us um, in evaluating some of these, um, these housing developments. That is a huge undertaking um, and we eagerly await it and hopefully one day we'll have it and it will assist us. But until that time, we're kind of evaluating these on a case by case basis. So you might get a letter from us that asks you to kind of run through um, what housing developments in, in the city date to the same period. 
whether or not they're still extant or whether or not they've been lost, because we're trying to evaluate, you know, yeah, are there a bunch of these? Do they all look the same? Okay, we've got five of these. Well, this one may or may not be as significant. And so, and so but if we've got one development from a certain period left, this is all we've got left to tell the history of these people and tell this history of our country. And we want to make sure um, that we take that into account. Now, um, if the property is going to be lost because it needs to be redeveloped for whatever reason, um, we want to make sure that we record and honor that history um, in some way. This uh, situation, um, they were demolishing um, the housing complex. And um, as part of this, they were developing a history, I believe, of um, similar developments in the city and were going to put on um, a display at local libraries that would kind of travel throughout the city um, and explain that history uh, to people. So that gets that out there to more people. And we also did, um, they also did a recordation of the buildings and a, a history. So. Um, it's it, we just want to make sure that we take even the things that are more utilitarian in nature. We, we don't lose that history. So, um, are there any questions? We'll give everybody a minute to um, see if anybody wants to type anything in um, with any questions about this section, or if you'd like to unmute and ask a question, please do. Okay, so Jason says, um, with public housing properties, we can get the entire properties review in one fell swoop, correct? So if the property was all list, all constructed around the same period or like within a, a certain phase, yes. If the property is all on one parcel, yes. So the way that you want to submit this to our office is, um, if you have something that it was all constructed, maybe over a period of years, you want to list that period of years. So, like, maybe it was constructed uh, between 1963 and 1965, then you would list that information. If you have a part of the um, public housing, pro you know, development that was um, constructed 1963 to 1965, and then you have another phase from 1980, what you want to do is on your Google map, you want it, so you'll give us our regular map. Then you'll give me a zoomed in shot of uh, the parcel on Google. Draw a line around the part from 1965. Draw a line around the part from 1980s. Write that date on there. And then when you do your photographs, give me, these are a picture of what all, of, you know, they all kind of look the same in the development, you know. This is what they look like generally. Here's a couple examples of what we had from our 1960s development. Here's what we have from our 1980s development. With that information, I'll be able to look and see um, if the um, area has integrity, if the, if the photographs are, are good. Should be able to look and see if it has integrity. Um, if it has a high level of integrity, then we might need to talk a little bit more about the history of um, the development, or if it has an architectural style. Sometimes it's rare, but every now and then um, we'll run across um, one of these developments that has an interesting architectural style. And so it might be eligible for architecture. So we'll look at that um, as well. Um, so I will look at your overview. If it, you know, kind of looks like the standard development um, that we see, because they kind of have a couple of designs throughout um, Missouri, um, and if they kind of have a similar history, we'll look at that and, and evaluate it. Most of them, I would say, um, are, we go ahead and go on the not eligible side because there's so many that are kind of ubiquitous um, across the state. 
um, but then there are some that have that um, that area or level of significance um, that we look at um, whenever we're evaluating that. So we might be in touch for more information about that. Um, but yes, you can put it all in one. If you have multiple sites, say across a city, and you're getting ready to do your five-year plan, um, put all, each development in its own submittal. Um, so, you know, this cluster uh, here, you know, on this street is, you know, in a packet for that. If you have a cluster somewhere else in town, maybe constructed the same period or a different period, put that in a separate 106 submittal. So break it up if the location is not the same. But if they're all um, together in one location, it can be one submittal. Um, which criteria do I use to determine eligibility for public housing? Um, they usually are under uh, criterion A for, um, you know, it could be uh, for government, it could be for um, social history. It just kind of depends. So um, it also, um, you know, whenever we're looking at these, we might send you a letter and ask about how it was originally funded. So what we want to know is, was there this like part of a large nationwide program um, in which they were giving funding to um, through two different developments? And then that's how it might be um, eligible under politics and government. So that's there's multiple different uh, criteria. Uh, I mean, areas of significance, but usually um, it's under criterion A. Like I said, there have been a few that have architectural elements that might make them eligible. Um, this is more common under criterion C with um, housing towers, because um, some of them have style, and then some of the developments, um, you can tell were definitely um, designed by um, an architect and thought out with space and, and things like that. So they could be under criterion C as well. This is Amy. Um, I also wanted to make the point that buildings and, and any sites, any any historic property can be eligible under multiple criteria. Um, and all sites and historic properties should be evaluated for their um, significance under each criteria. So it can't just be, well, this is a public housing building, therefore it's we evaluate it under criterion A. You have to look at all the criterion because it can be eligible under multiple and it might be one that you don't realize. And it's totally possible for something to be eligible under two different whole time periods. Like it's possible for a historic district to be eligible, um, you know, for its development from, you know, 1890 to 1940 and also have a prehistoric archeological site component to it. So they're completely unrelated. So it is possible um, for them to be eligible in multiple ways. There's not a kind of one size fits all approach. And I think that there's been kind of a perception of a one size fits all. And I think that's something in preservation that we're evaluating um, at this time, you know, and trying to do better. And like I said, wanted to take into account um, the history of people that's been overlooked and um, trying to apply the criteria a little more liberally. There is a question there from Don Booth, Amanda, that I'm gonna to throw to you because I don't know. Um, is one measure of integrity a determination of whether or not any modifications are reversible? That's a great question. We review properties as they are right now. So if you send me a picture of a downtown building and you say, you know, it's got the slip cover over the outside, but underneath, um, I can tell that this original storefront is intact. That's lovely to know, and I appreciate that, but I have to evaluate in its current condition. So that's also to say that that slip cover might be eligible as well. So it might be eligible for the changes that happened in the mid century, or it might be eligible, um, you know, for the, the period of significance. Um, that it, it dates to with that those alterations and changes. So alterations and changes can contribute and still make things eligible for listing on the National Register, but we have to evaluate what we've got right now. Um, I can't evaluate on it. Well, if that was rehabbed, it would be eligible for listing on the National Register, but right now, you know, it's, it's a mess. No, I'm evaluating what it is right now. 
Um, slip covers, yes. Thank you, Gina. Often date to the 1960s, but anywhere kind of mid-century forward, they are the covers that were built kind of over the downtown um, storefront, and often they left most of the original storefront intact. Underneath there, they would have taken off things that projected out a little bit further. Um, and then, um, uh, but but a lot of times it retains the integrity underneath there. Um, so um, it's important if your project is to remove a slip cover um, to maybe do a facade restoration. Um, I know we have a few uh, CDBG projects that do facade uh, repairs and restoration. Um, you might want to contact our office before you peel off that slip cover and find out if that's eligible first um, and then um, see if what your project scope should really be. Because, I mean, the property owner may be like, well, I really want to take it back to its original look at 1900, but it may have significance and may be eligible with its current appearance. So in that case, before you go, you know, you don't you don't want to um, inadvertently um, have some, you know, a, a situation where you've demolished a part of the historic property ahead of time. So I would say in that case, if you've got a slip cover and you've got a facade improvement program to contact our office before they remove the slip cover, um, just in case. All right, guys, if that's no more questions, we're approaching the noon hour. And so this is a pretty good stopping point for our lunch break. So why don't we go ahead and break for lunch and we will get this thing started back at 1 p.m. And unless unless we wanted to do those couple of slides talking about TCPs and finish up this step, but we can go ahead and we can go ahead and go to lunch. Yeah, those, those are, are quick, quick steps, steps, dude. <laughs> so. Is, is yeah. everybody okay holding on for a few more minutes just to talk about these last couple of items under step two so that we can uh, break um, cleanly in between step two and step three? I'm seeing thumbs up. Okay, let's go ahead and I'll, I'll switch over to Amy to discuss those items before lunch. control. All right. So let me get the thing to move forward. There we go. All right. So the other type of property that often comes up is something that is referred to as traditional cultural properties or TCPs or um, they are areas of religious or cultural significance in the actual um, Section 106 regulations. Um, traditional cultural properties are areas that are rooted in a the, the history of a living community. Um, this is often applied to Native American communities, but there are also things like um, Church of Latter-day Saints, which is what the photo is of here. Um, but these can only be identified through consultation. Um, no archaeologist is going to be able to identify um, these necessarily. They're something that has to be identified and mitigation has to be worked out with those those groups because we we have no qualifications to be able to do that. Um, they are important for maintaining the continuity of the cultural identity of that community. So they are um, something that's really integral to the community. Um, I have cited National Register Bulletin uh, 38 here, guidelines for evaluating and documenting TCPs or traditional cultural properties, um, that if you have any questions about traditional cultural properties, I would refer you to that document. Um, they, the other thing to remember about traditional cultural properties, just like landscapes, they have to be bounded in some way. It can't be something like um, a, a, the sky or um, the water or, or something or just nature in general. It has to be a, a bounded area. Um, 
the local example, the um, Caldwell County, that is actually from here. Um, the Church of Latter-day Saints for um, the reorganized church. Um, they know, and, and I really don't have a whole lot of examples. They're not ones that the SHPO can monitor or document. Um, again, they have to come from consulting parties. Um, does Missouri have a number limit on what, to what defines a community? For example, if a property is significant to a family, no, that does not count. A family is not a community. We're talking about a larger community. It can be a town, um, but not, um, I would refer you to bulletin 38. Um, if you're looking for a specific number, because I do not know one, um, but that is, but I don't believe a family would fall in there. Um, I'm too far. So national historic landmarks are something that um, they're almost a step above what just listing on the National Register, um, and it, they're specifically called out in the law that if they are being adversely affected, um, uh, the head of the, they are to the maximum extent possible. So they are, they are almost necessarily required to avoid it. Especially since most national historic landmarks are the things that kind of turn into our state parks. Um, looking at the comments, um, will you have some Native American sites that are cultural? So, yes, you will have some Native American archaeological sites that are um, a traditional cultural property, but an Archaeologists can only identify it as an archaeological site. They cannot be the ones that identify it as a um, traditional cultural property. Um, the communities are no longer. Yes, it does include um, uh, communities that are no longer physically in present in the area. They have to be a living community, so they still have to be around, but they do not have to be in the area. Um, so because of Native American removal um, and that the LDS church has a larger number outside of the state. Um, right, they're not exclusively for tribes. Um, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> National Register challenges. Um, so a lot of the challenges under the net with the National Register that things that were listed in the, you know, right when the 106 um, and the, the National Historic Preservation Act were passed. Um, they, they don't provide a comprehensive list of contributing properties um, and they may not fully explain the character defining features of a property. Um, it's especially true for cultural landscapes and properties that have um, that are achieved significance in in the last fifty years. Um, they they also don't necessarily have very good boundaries on what the National Register boundaries are. Um, so they they may not ac accurately reflect what the resource is. They could be too large and encompass um, two entire entire farmsteads. Um, when it's for certain um, mound groups in on the land, but not necessarily encompassing the whole area, um, or they could be too small and and end at the bottom of something like um, and and when you need to have actually more area surrounding it designated. Um, so, contributing versus non-contributing. Um, a building site structure or object adding to the historic significance of that property is considered a contributing source. So when you have a historic district, you have contributing resources and you have non-contributing resources. 
um, when things are contributing to a resource, they are adding to the historic value of that that district. When they are non contributing, um, we just hope that they're not detracting from the the historic properties. Um, So archaeology challenges. Um, less than 10% of our state has been subject to archaeological survey. Um, and so that leaves a lot of area to cover. Um, Prehistoric archaeology and, and historic archaeology both focus on different things and in the past have been laser focused on only certain things. Um, and historic archaeology has not been as prevalently looked at in the past. Um, the value of having um, farmsteads and documenting what is historic has not been thought of as necessary because a lot of people have looked at it and said, well, we have a written record for the historic. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that his written record is only as good as as how much you think people are telling you the truth um archaeology and especially when you look at um excavating old um, dump sites and it tells you what people were actually doing because of the presence of those things um so archaeology whereas prehistoric archaeology has only been focused previously on large sites like occupation sites or mounds um, and didn't didn't really look into the smaller sites that could be uncovered. Um, and as we get into those sites and as we look more and more into the um, like say the date that people arrived in Missouri, that date gets Push further and further back, the more and more we look into prehistoric archaeology um, and, and the people who were here at that time. So we, we don't, um, we, it's very hard to say that there isn't going to be an archaeological site because there are parts of the state that if there's a flat piece of ground, chances are someone was living on it. Um, so that's sort of one of the challenges that archaeology has. Um, uh, as far as general SHPO challenges, after all of this that we've been talking about, one of the things that we wanted to highlight is that um, the more we have to question who's the federal agency, is something eligible? Um, did they miss something when they were doing their evaluations? Um, where are they getting their borrow from? Does their APE cover their project? Um, <laughs> have they photographed everything that I need to see? Um, these kind of things, the more we have to fuss and, and wonder or ask questions, the longer your projects are going to take. That's, um, we, we definitely, uh, need people to understand that, that that is often the biggest problem is that the more we have to wonder, the more we have to look into something or or contact all of you for additional information. That's what makes projects take longer. Um, Angela, does Missouri recognize a proto historic period? Um, the time before European? Yes. Yes, we do. Um, Uh, so common questions, how often do I need to update my information? Depends on the information. Um, we have a couple of dates. Amanda threw out some earlier of like five years that we keep our files. Um, and so any projects that you have that haven't, nothing's been submitted to us for five years on, we likely don't have the file anymore. Um, after six months, any record searches um, will need to be updated. Um, 
I'm trying to think of some of the other things. Amanda? Um, as, as far as how often do you need to update your project information? Well, I'm, it just says update my information. So I'm trying to think of other aspects of updating information people oh, okay. that I didn't get to. Yeah, um, basically, like, if your scope of work hasn't changed and your letter is under five years old, um, then it's still good. If um, your project scope of work has changed, that means you need to update your submission to our office. Um, if, um, you know, your construction date changes, we don't, we don't need to know that. We're not really concerned about what date your construction date is, um, but just that you're within that five years. Yes. So, um, thank you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. So, is our is our property listed on the National Register? That's something that you can look on our website. Um, there are maps available um, that map the listed properties on the National Register. Um, uh, if our property is listed on the National Register or the National Historic Landmark, do I need to do any work to identify historic resources within the APE? Um, yes. So, part of this is, is that, um, yes, you will have the overarching National Historic Landmark, the National Register eligible um, or listed site. Um, but you, you still need to address what your entire APE is and include those listed um, and landmark sites in your identification, but they aren't your only identification. Um, there can be sites associated with them. There can be other structures in the area that weren't previously recorded. Um, is the 50 year mark set in stone? Um, as Amanda discussed earlier, not exactly. It's usually if something is 45 years um, that we're looking at if a project, because depending on how long it takes for a project to go forward. Um, and also things can be eligible before that 50 year mark um, that make yeah, like the arch was eligible before it was ever 50 years old. Um, and so determination of eligibility, like we've said a couple of times, the determination of eligibility of historic properties is the responsibility of the federal agency. The SHPO either agrees or disagrees, so we concur or not concur with that agency's findings. And if a consensus cannot be reached, the agency will then send the documentation and the SHPO will send their documentation to the National Park Service and request a, <clears throat> and request a formal determination from the keeper of the National Register and the keeper's determination is final. So that is the end. of step two. Are there any questions? Hey, Amy, it's Amanda. I'd just like to point out, I put a couple links in the chat for you guys. Um, one to a link to our map site. Um, when you go to that site, the um, it's a little um, cumbersome right now. It's um, if you have, you see there's a brown title on there and, and you click on that brown title in order to get to the map. I know we used to kind of have a picture of a map that you could click on. Um, we're still um, working on our web page. Um, and so we're, we're not sure if we're going to be able to get that back just yet or not, but you can click on that, that brown title and it'll take you to the map. And then I also linked to all of our national register listings. They are listed by county. Um, so if you identify a property um, that's um, eligible in the map, um, then you can go and look up the National Register listing on that page. So we'll give everybody a couple minutes. Um, how often are the map and the um, 
the National Register listings. We are a little behind on getting our National Register listings um, up to date online. Uh, my understanding is um, because of the switchover with the website, there was um, some delay there. So we should be getting those um, up to date soon. And um, I think, Amy, do you know if the um, GIS is up to date or Jeffrey? I think for, um, I think it's pretty close. Um, no, um, we are running behind. Just on national register listings, not because that's what's available to the public. We both muted. We both unmuted, and then we both muted. Um, yeah, on national register listings, as far as we know, we are fine. We don't enter those. So, yeah. Um, if you ever have a question about a national register listing, um, you can reach out to our national register and survey section. And Michelle Diedrich is um, the section chief in that section, and they can help you out with those. Um, is anybody else having issues? Cassie says she's having issues with her audio. Um, I'm not having any issues, but um, what about you guys, Amy, Jeffrey? Nope. Sounds good to me. All right, so we'll give each everybody one more minute um, to make a question if there are any. Um, Okay, I would say it looks like, um, you know, questions are probably done for now. So um, it's 1215. Um, so like Jeffrey said earlier, um, we were planning about an hour for lunch. So we'll see everybody back at 115. Um, and if you have any questions in the interim, um, I will get to them whenever we get back. So write them down so you don't forget them. Thanks everybody for participating. This has been great to have so many comments and um, you know questions from everybody. Um, so we're really happy to to have you guys today. So thank you. See you all at one fifteen. And we're just going to leave this on the the WebEx will stay on, so you don't have to worry about getting disconnected unless you unless something weird happens. So it should be should just stay there and then we'll be back at 115 and um, yeah 115 Hello, everybody. This is Amanda. I hope everybody had um, a good lunch break and is refreshed and ready for the second half of our section 106 training. Um, I noticed that there have been a few questions in the chat um, during lunch. So I'm going to go ahead and start by answering those questions and then um, we'll move on for there. So I see that Tony had a question about replacing a door. It says, if you have a door which needs to be replaced, but is surrounded by a closed porch and or a closed in porch now, the door is buffered. So does do you need to submit that to our office for review? 
I'm assuming that this is a weatherization project. Um, so if it's not, I'm going to, I'm going to answer both ways. Um, whether it's a weatherization project or not, and the reason why there is a difference is. We have a statewide programmatic agreement um, in place for weatherization that has some exemptions set up in place already. And um, those exemptions outline things in which SHPO does not need to be consulted in. So um, if it was an item that's listed in the programmatic agreement as something um, that doesn't need to be consulted with our office, then you would not need to talk to us. So that's like if the property is under 45 years old, um, I think what this scenario is describing is that there is a door. It used to be an exterior door. The porch is closed in and um, so now do you have to come to our office? Um, I, I cannot 100% remember um, what is in the PA. So I'm going to, I'm just going to refer you to the PA um, about uh, for that, but in general, if you have a project um, and it is an undertaking, you would need to consult with our office whether the door is on the outside or the inside. Um, so any any potential to affect a historic property consultation with our office is required. Um, so I hope that helps to answer your question, Tony. Um, let's see. If uh, just a reminder, if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint, please email the Mo Section 106 email, and we will get a copy out to you. Um, in addition, are we un, uh, are we re recording again, Jeffrey? We are, and yes, I will. Um, usually, the last time I recorded a meeting, it took about 24 hours before WebEx was able to generate the link that I could share with people. But as soon as I have that link, uh, we'll get it out. To, since I have everyone's emails on here, obviously, we can send that link out to people once I have that. Thank you. Um, so just in case there's anybody who's on the phone who cannot see um, the chat, um, Karen Daniels from MoDOT has um, posted in the chat. She says that um, if your project includes a vehicular bridge, MoDOT can help with evaluation. If FHWA funding is involved, please submit through e, uh, sorry, RER process. If FHWA funding is not involved, please send me an email at karen.daniels at mo.mo.gov and ask for a bridge evaluation. Include the bridge number, county, roadway carried, and feature crossed. It may take a couple of weeks to get a response to you, but we're happy to help um, local governments and their consultants and SHPO deal with the bridges. So thank you for that offer, Karen. That's really helpful. So Joe has said, um, for large highway projects, do you need to conduct an archival review for each building to determine uh, criteria A or B? Would you get the same information from the general archival review of the community? Um, this would require researching hundreds of buildings. Thanks. So generally, like if we have a corridor, we've got tons of buildings, it's probably better to just consult with us about the project. Um, if it's a highway project, I'm sure uh, MoDOT's involved and probably just scheduling a meeting to kind of discuss what's going to work best for that particular project um, ahead of time would probably be the best way to do that. That way we could kind of look um, at an overview of the types of resources um, that you're looking at. Um, and, and the area that you're looking at for your archival review. Um, and then, you know, after we did that, that would kind of help um, set up parameters for that project. And, and then we could do similar things for future projects. So I think when you have a large project, it's really a good idea to just consult with us. Um, we're happy to talk with you and uh, see what we can do. Uh, and then Craig had made a comment about um, if a door can be seen from the street, then 
a SHPO um, cannot be seen from the street, then there's no SHPO review needed. I'm not sure. I would have to go back and check the um, the programmatic agreement. If anybody needs a copy of the programmatic agreement, just send me an email and I'd be happy uh, to send it to you. Just let me know that you would like to see the DOE weatherization programmatic agreement and I will send that to you. Um, if it's not a weatherization project, I know Craig does uh, weatherization. So if it's not a weatherization project, you still need to consult um, for all undertakings that have potential to affect properties. So um, historic properties, sorry. Um, if you have a programmatic agreement in place, then there might be some different rules. So if that, um, I think that's all the questions. Did I miss anything, Amy or Jeffrey? No, I think that covers it. Okay, well, then I will mute and let you take over. All right, thank you. 